In beginning this sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, it's a small turning point, not one of the, the great turning points in Mark's Gospel, but this moment when he returns home is clearly one of those significant points in his life. But let's do a bit of geography. Let's get a bit of a background for the Gospel of Mark. So the Holy Land. In the very north is the Sea of Galilee. Then there's the, the Long Rift Valley, the, the Jordan River Valley, uh, leading down into the Dead Sea. And all of that part of the world is all below sea, below sea level. So Nazareth is located up there uh, in the north. But in the Gospel of Mark, we simply launch straight into the story. It begins, verse 1. This is the beginning of the good news of King Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's nothing about the, the birth. There's no stories about any of those events. We jump straight into the ministry of John. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, uh, so Mark 1.4. And we normally situate that just in that area to immediately to the north of the Dead Sea. And then Jesus, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And then he goes off into the wilderness driven by the Holy Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness. And then in verse 14, we hear that he comes back to Galilee. So this is the, the whole of the, the early part of the, the ministry of Jesus, a very rapid movement through it. And Mark loves to tell us about the, the geography of the area. So this is the Galilee. It's centered on the Sea of Galilee and the, uh, the area mainly to the west of the sea. The sea has all kinds of different names. So when you read in scripture different names, it's probably referring to the same body of water. So it's called the Lake of Kinneret still in Hebrew. Uh, it's found that in the book of Numbers first, but in other places in the Hebrew scriptures. Also the Sea of Galilee, most commonly. Uh, that's the way it's described in the, in the New Testament in the Gospels. But it's also called the Lake of Gennesaret. It's also called the Lake of Tiberias because that was the, the town on the western shore that was the most significant town in the Roman period and still to this day is the most significant settlement uh, around the lake. Uh, also called Ginnasar uh, in the ba Babylonian Talmud and in Arabic it's called the, the Sea of Minya. So various names but for the same body of water. The whole of the, the lake is below sea level. Uh, so this is a kind of a heat map showing the, the different heights uh, above sea level and below sea level. So you see in this, this map uh, the areas that are yellow and green are above sea level and blue is, is well below and purple is, uh, is quite high. So even on the, the western shore of the, the lake, uh, the hills are quite high. So they raise about four or five hundred meters above the level of the sea and then much higher on the eastern and then the, the northwest. Uh, you get these very high mountains, uh, more than a thousand meters uh, distance above the, the sea. So very significant hills and valleys. Um, and then just these little areas that are, are flat to the north and to the west of the lake. Otherwise, it's quite, uh, quite hilly, quite uh, the significant cliffs. About 13 k's east to west, about 21 k's north to south, 53 kilometers around. The whole lake is about 215 meters below sea level. And then the deepest part of the lake is only about 43 meters. So uh, the shallowness of the lake is one of the reasons that the storms, when they blow up, can be so ferocious because there's not much volume of water within which to uh, dissipate those winds. So the, the lake, uh, as I said, Mark loves telling us about the geography of Jesus. And so when you look through the Gospel of Mark, as I did last year on retreat, um, I found the 62 Marker, 62 indications of where the event happens, way more than any of the other Gospels, a few more than, than Matthew, who bases his story very closely on the, the story of Mark. But Luke, for example, is about half as many. Uh, and a lot of the times in Luke, he's very vague. In a certain place, this thing happened. Uh, and John, John is much more interested in telling us the time of events. He would tell us the place, 
but it's in the Gospel of John that we get any indication of the three-year ministry of Jesus. When you read through the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you don't get any indication at all about how long the events, how long the public ministry of Jesus happened. All you are told is that Jesus was about 30 when he began his ministry. That's it. No other markers. Whereas John's Gospel tells us principally through the celebration of the Jewish festivals as to when these events took place. So we get this, this sense of this movement in and around the lake uh, as he crosses the lake, as he goes from one village to another. All of this sense of the ministry of Jesus in these first five chapters are all there just around the lake. And occasionally he will go off down to the southeast, which is uh, part of the, the, the Gentile area. So the Jews mainly occupied the western shore and the Gentiles and pagans uh, to the eastern shore. And so then when in the beginning of chapter 6, there's this marked difference, this movement. It's much further to travel to Nazareth, about 40 kilometers by, uh, by walking. So it's a, it's a pretty significant couple of days of walking. Um, Sarah's there, one of my walking companions from a couple of years ago, and she's just done this long walk in, in France. So we know about the, the realities of, of walking, and James, of course, joined me last year in Spain of the walking. So we know the distances that are involved. And then he arrives in Nazareth. It's not actually described in the text. It doesn't say that's where it is. It was introduced, as I said, at the beginning of the gospel. But it says he went home. He went to his hometown, but with his disciples. So it's significant that he's not just going by himself. So it's not just a holiday that he's taking to go back home. But he's, he's going in his role as a rabbi. In Mark's gospel, it was in chapter 3 that he called the 12 uh, apostles to be with him. So it's already this larger group of disciples. In Matthew, he delays that until chapter 10 of the calling of the disciples to be the apostles, the 12. But here, he goes to his home and he begins after a few days, it seems, it's a Sabbath. And as, the, as we've seen, that the ministry in the synagogue was controlled by the president and the president would simply choose somebody to preach. There was no designated preacher that whoever happened to be there that seemed to be the, the most qualified would be called upon to preach on that day. And so Jesus is the one who steps forward to preach. Now, Nazareth, um, we, we hear in the Gospel of Matthew that, uh, that Jesus and Joseph and Mary, when they'd been down in Egypt to escape from the persecution of Herod, that they had wanted, when they heard the death of Herod, they'd gone back to to Bethlehem, it seems, to resettle there, but then heard that uh, the, one of the sons of Herod had now been the ruler there, and so they said, that's not safe, so let's go to Galilee. And they settled in Nazareth, and Matthew tells us in 2.23 that that was in fulfillment of the prophecy that he will be called uh, a Nazarene. Now, if you look through the whole of the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, do you find the town Nazareth mentioned? No. It's not there anywhere. And there is no prophecy to say that he will be called a Nazarene. So what is Matthew hinting at? Matthew's always very precise, and he will usually quote which prophet. But here he just says, in the prophets. So it's clear that he's wanting to do something different. And it seems that he's referring to Isaiah 11, that prophecy that indicated that although the, the line of David might seem to have died, there will be this branch, this new shoot that will spring up and that will be the hope of the Messiah, this new life that will be possible. And in Hebrew, that word for branch or stick is the word nazar. And so it seems that Matthew hears that similarity between uh, Nazareth, nazar, and connects the two together. So a Nazarene is simply someone who's uh, a branch man, a stick man, someone who comes from the sticks quite literally. And so to, to say that Jesus is a Nazarene, it's not a good thing to say. It's saying he's coming from the sticks, he's coming from the branch, but connecting it back to that Isaiah 11 prophecy. And so this is you know, further proof of, of this whole insignificance of Nazareth. And yet, when Jesus arrives on this day, how do the people treat him? <laughs> Where did this man get all this? Where, what deeds of power are being done by his hands? Because he's just one of us, they're saying. He's just one of the, these common workers. 
And they say, not just that, but he is this carpenter. In Greek, it's the word tekton, which can be a carpenter, but not someone who's just crafting you know, timber products, but fitting out houses. Or it's a more general term, so it's just a worker, but it could be someone who's a craftsman. For example, we see the word in the writings of Homer, and there he says that he employed a tekton to build him a boat. And so a tekton could be someone that's very versatile, being useful for all kinds of different things. In some ways, it also could be that suggestion that Jesus is the craftsman, the one who's able to repair all of our ills, all of the things that go wrong in our hearts, in our lives. He can be the one to step in and, and help solve all of those problems. Uh, just as a way of curiosity, uh, so tekton is a worker, and architecton is the chief worker, so the one who, who oversees all of that work, and so that's where we get the word architect uh, in our English. But then, of course, Jesus isn't able to do anything in that town. He's amazed at their lack of faith. We know that faith is a small unit. It doesn't take much faith. He says, you know, faith the size just of a mustard seed uh, earlier in the gospel. And so faith is, is not this great thing that we need to be able to have. But faith is an openness. Faith is a desire, a longing for God just to be open to God's work, to be available to let God do his work. If faith is there, then God can do the most amazing and incredible things. But the problem is that so often in our church we snuff out the faith and we, we allow it just to dissipate. We bore people out of their faith and we, we don't allow people to be encouraged and inspired and to catch that flame of faith. And so faith needs to be protected. Faith needs to be nurtured and nourished by communities that encourage that faith in one another, to allow others to see in our hearts and in our lives and in the practice of our lives that faith that is able to, to do the wonders that Jesus wants to do. He wants to do incredible things in our community and through our community in the wider world. But we have to be a faith-filled community and we have to be people that encourage that and nurture that faith and not allow it to die away. The problem is that so often that people begin to drift away and we, we let them. We don't, we don't go after them. We don't go searching for them. We don't go to say, come, come back and be, have your faith nurtured once again in this community. And we need to be that community that allows others to experience this faith so that Jesus will be amazed by the power of our faith and the glory of our faith that is present among us. So let's be that people that let Jesus do the mighty works that he wants to do among us. And let's continue to pray for one another, that we will be a community of faith, growing in faith and encouraging each other to step in faith today.